to profit. It's usually said that if you follow your passion, then the money will follow. But is that the case? Well, we'll find out tonight. Today, we are joined by three guests. We have Idi Mugo Gashoki, who is the CEO of Qtro Entertainment. We are also joined by Sarah Nyingimwelu, who is the Enterprise Development Officer at Equity Group Foundation. And we have Anthony Kirangandiritu, who is the founder of Call Main Hatchery Limited. Welcome. Now, to start off this conversation, I'll start off with you, Edie. Tell us a little bit about Qtro Entertainment. How did you get into this business? And did you work in the corporate sector before? And what inspired you to get into this? Okay, well, you guys, I'm Edie. And uh, I started this passion of uh, being in entertainment while I was in high school. I started as a photographer, but later I majored into entertainment involving sound, DJ services, and many other more things. But before then, I had not uh, specified on entertainment because I had not undergone the, the, the main learning that I required to start that. That's why I joined the program by Equity Bank called the Young Africa Youth Works. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you very much. I'll also give Anthony an opportunity to tell us a little bit about how he got into um, the hatchery business. Anthony? Everyone, I'm Anthony Kiranga Nderito. I'm the CEO and founder of Colmin Hatchery. Colmin Hatchery, I started the company in my final year as my project. I can say it's a coupling of my passion and uh, my experiences as I grew up. I've always loved, I've always loved electrical engineering and uh, we, as I was growing up, we were poultry farmers. And uh, on joining campus, I was able to couple my passion and uh, what I love to come up with my company. Okay, thank you. Now, Sarah, it's usually said that if we follow our passion, then the money will follow. But sometimes that's not the reality, and that's why we have a number of businesses starting, and then in a little while, they close down. So now tell us, how do you know that that passion that you have, whether it's cooking, whether it's being in the music industry, whether it's in farming, actually has business potential? Okay, thank you. Uh, for you to know that uh, the passion that you are undergoing through, it's uh, on the right path to making money. First of all, uh, you have to come up with a business idea, whereby if it is photography, if you're in the entertainment, if uh, you're in the archery, Whatever kind of business that you're thinking of, you have to come up with the business idea. So after you come up with the business idea, you also have to do a market research, whereby the, you test about uh, the idea that you have. You check on other businesses that are like to the idea that you have. You also carry business analysis. We normally have several business analyses. Uh, but for me, I prefer the SWOT analysis, whereby you expose your idea to the SWOT analysis. And after you've done the SWOT analysis, you're able to, uh, to know which business idea really works well for you. And uh, you'll be on the right path to make money using your passion. Okay, you've talked about the SWOT analysis. That's the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats. But how do you go about categorizing each of these and finding what they are. Many people have a passion and they haven't gone to business school and they only have, you know, the basics. They heard this is successful. How do you go about doing a SWOT analysis? One by one, step by step. Uh, for the SWOT analysis, uh, maybe I can say what the SWOT means. The, 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 the S stands for the strength. Then the W stands for the weakness. The O stands for the opportunity. And the T stands for the threats. For you to be able to do that analysis, we normally offer trainings at Equity Group Foundation via our customers of Equity. So we can take you through how to do the SWOT analysis and whichever business analysis that you prefer. There are several business analyses, but for today I'll not mention that. But if you come to our classes, you'll be able to understand all those business analyses that we use to analyze our business idea. Okay, thank you. Now, Edie, before you got into Quitro um, Entertainment, yeah. how did you decide this is the business for me? Did you do some research the way um, uh, Sarah told us, or how did you go about it? Did you just say, I have a passion for it, and I'm going to go for it, or did you do some research, uh, do some business plan, and then went into the field? How did you go about it? At first, I did some research, but you see, this is something I'd loved before. Eh? So I did some research. 
I looked what is required for me to do this. So I measured into it. So I did some research online. I looked at other companies. I see what they do, what they have done. And later I came to build my own entertainment. You said you looked at other companies. How did you look at them? Did you just go online and see, okay, this one is doing this? How did you know you saw this company? How did you know that it was actually profitable? Because you could have seen a, a business online, but how do you know it's actually profitable and how it is operating so that you could probably borrow from that to start your own business? Okay, I did some research online, and later on I came even much closer to working with it at some point. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Anthony, how did you go about starting um, the hatchery? Uh, how did you even identify that there was a, a space in this for uh, the hatchery? Uh, I was able to identify in my final year, we, we were needed to have a project and I have always, always marveled in the electronics product. So the fact that we, have done, we had uh, done poultry farming earlier, I thought uh, of incubators and uh, at the same time, at the same time, uh, I saw an advert of uh, one of the incubators in Kenya, which uh, was an advert of uh, a challenge. It was called uh, Leap2, which was a challenge around uh, around uh, the circular economy. So I sat and uh, tried to Google over to, to try and find out how I can be able to join my idea of an incubator to the circular economy. And uh, it is at this point that I it came to me that uh, solar power is within the solar is within the circular economy, and so I I found a way that I would uh, make my solar incubator not uh, not uh, just powered powered by electricity, and uh, that's how I incorporated uh, this, a, a solar hatchery, and uh, from this I was able to come up to, to register it as a company through the program some months later. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Now, uh, for all our viewers, please feel free to send your comments on the comment section and we'll sample them as we go. If you have comments, if you have questions for our panelists, please feel free to write them down there. Now, um, I'll go to you, um, Sarah. Tell us, how do we categorize, uh, categorize passion? How do we know, okay, maybe I have a passion for baking, for cooking. How can I categorize the different passions I have and determine that this one is actually a business uh, viable business and the ones that are just something that you should do as a hobby? How do you go about saying, this is a passion I have, but maybe this is not profitable. This one is a passion I have, I can monetize it. Okay, for you to understand uh, the passion that you have and how you can monetize it, first of all, you have to do the market research. And with the market research, we will understand what is available in the market and how have they been doing it in the market and what difference would you bring while you're offering the passion that you have as a business. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. You're, you're saying what are you offering that's different that, for, than what is being offered in the market. Now, like for you, Edie, how did you go about saying, I mean, there are many entertainment companies. How did you go and say, this is the unique offering that I have for the market that will enable me to stay through the tough times? Because we know businesses take a while to break even. So how did you determine that I have this unique offering that other people are not offering? And what is it that you're offering that's different from what other people are offering? Okay, to, to me, cute entertainment, I choose uh, photography and DJ services. Eh? And you see for photography, actually, uh, everything now is revolving about photography. Like for now, if you have a birthday, wedding, bio, you see. So I sat down and I looked at this job. I saw that this job, it's very sustaining. Eh? It's very hard for someone to, to lack a job. Eh? Yeah, that, and it's the, the thing that is unique about us, eh? we are very fast. We do things immediately, and if it's photography or DJ services, you take the pictures and send to the client immediately. Then we are all over Google. We have marketed ourselves online. We are on Google search, Facebook, Instagram, everything. Yeah. Okay, so you're outlining the importance of marketing. Marketing. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'd like us to discuss a little bit about roadblocks, because every business has a roadblock. So and I'll start with you, Anthony. What are some of the roadblocks that you encountered as you were trying to roll out your business and how did you overcome them or are you still facing them? Yeah, I think uh, during the journey, there has been some, uh, some roadblocks. And uh, one, one was the fact that uh, 
me and my team, we were from the from a technical background. We have done electro engineering. And so we were so obsessed with the technical aspects and uh, about the product, how to make the electronic product perfect. And so we forgot about uh, about the business side of a business. There was uh, marketing uh, and listening to clients. So we were so obsessed with perfecting the product without uh, uh, the, the marketing feedback. And so during our first, uh, our very first pilot stage, uh, rolling out of the product, uh, we noticed that uh, while the, our product was working, uh, there was a slow demand. So from that, from the, from that, we were able to join a program by uh, Nylab which uh, we were taught on uh, marketing. And it is uh, from that that I was able to identify reason if the market is, uh, is crucial. And after going to the market, we went to our target, our first featured market, which was uh, Kilifi. After listening to the farmers, uh, we were able to obtain some valuable aspects. For example, we were able to note that uh, it is important to, not only to perfect, well, we perfect the product, they wanted more value. They wanted a, wanted a perfect product, which cost less, but for the, Customers they were ready to, to pay for value. That is a product that costs uh, a bit more, but of a larger capacity, and so we were able to incorporate that. Another, another, another great, another great uh, roadblock we have had is uh, about uh, red taping and gatekeeping. That is, uh, there are some uh, major roadblocks in the process. In the process of trying to comply, there are so. Even for startups, there are some complex procedures which, uh, as a startup, you are not able to know which are, are, are legal aspects. And so, when without uh, without proper without proper without uh, proper knowledge, you may not know that, for example, you are needed to file uh, maybe taxes annually. And so, after like a period of two years, the tax man comes back. And so, so those are the, the challenges we have uh, had during the journey but uh, we have tried to mitigate them through one way or another. Okay, thanks for that. Um, before I go to you, Edie, I want you to tackle this, Sarah. He's spoken about being focused on the technical side and really a business is really multifaceted and you need to know how to market. You need the soft side of it. So how do you strike that balance between knowing the technical side of a business and knowing that you need the other side, the software skills, the marketing, the sales, uh, the human resource side of it so that you can make sure your, your business is all encompassed and you can actually break even? Okay, thank you. Uh, at Equity, we normally offer trainings to our customers, whereby uh, most of you find some of the entrepreneurs, they went into entrepreneurship without these soft skills, without uh, the business management skills, without knowing how to balance their money or how to do their financial literacy or their financial education. Also, they don't know how to use the social media platform in order to market their business and also how to file their returns and all the legal aspect pertaining your business and the government. So we normally offer those trainings whereby we assist our customers with uh, the business management skills, whereby we train them about the marketing bit. We also train them about record keeping. We also train them about the cash flow management, how they're supposed to manage the money that uh, they utilize in their business and how to pay their utilities. We also train them on how, who is the right person to be recruited for their business because if they recruit the wrong employee, of course the business will suffer and so many, many other uh, trainings that we offer to them. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Edi, you can also contribute on the issue of roadblocks. What are some of the roadblocks that you encountered? And you said you were good in photography, so you were good at the technical side, but did you also know how to market and was that an issue? Did you collaborate with other people to make sure that all sides of the business are covered? Okay, thank you. The major roadblock I encountered first was the capital. Okay, because we obviously needed the equipment but uh, on, on the year 2019, that's when I joined the Equity Group York. Then the Equity taught me about money saving. I opened up a, an account. I started saving, saving, and in a duration of one year, I was able to, I was able to purchase professional equipment, like cameras, drones, everything. So the major challenge I had before was about the capital to buy the equipment. Then after that, I came into marketing. I was not good at marketing eh? because I usually to the, the job, I usually, my clients were my close friends. 
But later on, I learned uh, antiquity about marketing online. My business got into Google. We are ranked five star. So there even a client has trust when he searches about our services. Then another thing was trust between you and the customer. You see, like for now, you can have a client. Like for us, 75% of our customers are online, and people we have never met. Right? You see, there must be some trust issues. So when it comes to payment, we use the equity pay bill number. You see now when a customer is paying via equity, he can he has that ability of trusting us eh, and seeing that we are good at our business. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Now, Sarah, I want us to discuss a little bit about building capacity. So you've started your business and you've put things together, but how do we build capa capacity and scale our businesses as SMEs? Okay, thank you. Uh, at Equity, we normally assist our customers, like I've actually said. We assist our customers through the training, whereby we train them on their financial literacy, that is the financial education bit about the business. We also train them about uh, entrepreneurship education. We train them on the soft skills that they need to understand on their business management. We also train them on how to be present on the digital platform and how to utilize all the digital platforms that are there. After we have trained them, we also take them through the mentorship and coaching, whereby we work uh, with each of our customers on one-on-one -on -one basis and we're able to identify the gaps or the roadblocks that are available with this customer and uh, we assist them on how to close the gap in their roadblocks and uh, if it is a short-term roadblock we are actually able to assist them and transform their business within a short period and uh, we also assist them and link them with the bank and they're able to assess finances from the bank. Okay, yes. okay. And how long is this training? Uh, the training is supposed to carry uh, 20 hours uh, for, each, uh, for each module. That is for each, if it is entrepreneurship education, it is supposed to carry 20 to 24 hours. Uh, for the digital literacy, 20, 18 to 20 hours and also for the financial literacy. So basically we can say within a week you're supposed to be through with the trainings that are being offered at Equity Bank. Okay, okay. Now Anthony, um, did you experience problems with getting startup capital and just uh, having day-to-day -day costs? How are you able to manage that and how do you deal with those challenges? Yeah, indeed it is true that uh, during especially the first uh, the first few, the first year of our operation, we had uh, capital challenges, which uh, we were able after after submitting uh, our as a project. Now we were able to to apply. We we had networks that uh, knew some uh, incubation programs through our university, and so we were able to apply several incubation programs, which are programs which are geared towards nurturing startups and uh, finding. Uh, the ones that have uh, potential. And through these programs, we are able to, to enter some uh, programs which, which are able to fund us seed capital. And from this cap seed capital, we have been able to penetrate uh, the market and uh, through the analyze uh, how we are going. And from that, we have been able to be getting uh, more capital as we proceed. Okay, thanks for that. Now, um, it's said that sometimes the youth get over things very fast. So you're into something today, then tomorrow you're over it. And that's why they say sometimes the youth, millennials, they leave jobs very fast. You'll find somebody there for a year. Three years is a very long time these days for a youth to be in one job. What happens if you get over your passion and you're not passionate about what you do anymore? So Edie, for example, you, you're into photography today and then maybe some years down the line you're like, maybe I'm not into this anymore. So, so what happens to the business and what does that mean for business continuity? Does the business die with you or what does that mean? Mm -hmm. First of all, I think uh, to me, I have never gotten tired of what I do. You see, because the problem is, if you, you have passion for something, then you lose the focus. You'll still remain in the same point. You'll start another thing, then when you move on, you get tired, you start another thing, you see you'll be stuck in the same place. So for me, passion, I've 
even if that even if when the job is down, I try my best to know what's what's up, what's wrong, where should I where am I going wrong, what should I require? Is is my quality down? Should I need to upgrade? You see, so those are the things that have been keeping me going because I actually I try to look what is the problem behind my job going down. Okay, so you've mentioned something important that if you lose focus, that's when things start to tumble down. Now, Sarah, maybe you can tell us a little bit about this because there's a delicate balance because sometimes you start a business, you're really passionate about it, and then you go a little bit down the line and you're like, okay, maybe this does not make business sense. So how do we know that it's maybe we're not giving enough time or it actually does not make business sense and maybe we need to go back to the drawing board and see how to rejig our business plan or just stop it altogether and look for another passion to pursue. So where is that delicate balance between hanging on because we know that things don't happen overnight and knowing that, okay, this actually looked like a good idea but it isn't after all. Okay, thank you. Just like as Edi has just said, uh, he has said that uh, you have to be persistent in your passion. Because if you give up at uh, the first point, you will also start another business and mind you, you are involving money in this. So you'll be losing your capital, you'll be you losing your money while you leave that passion because it was your business idea, you had the passion. So uh, there are some uh, personal traits as a entrepreneur that you really need to have. You need to be resilient in your business. Uh, business normally face a lot of challenges. They face uh, business cycles. Sometimes the business is good, sometimes the business is down. So if you're committed to your business, if you're resilient to your business, if you've taken calculated risk for your business, of course, you will be able to pick up. Even if it is down, try and check where is the gap, where is the problem, where is the challenge. Maybe you can try and get uh, customer feedback from your customers. They'll give you a direction. Is it the quality of your service or product? Is it uh, a problem that maybe you're not doing enough marketing? Is it that uh, you're not keeping good records in your business? Is it that the business is suffering from capital? That is, uh, you don't have money to run uh, your business. So because of all those factors, you need to be persistent and also be resilient in your business for it to thrive. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Anthony, you can contribute to that. How do you stay resilient? You said you'd have problems. So there are so many procedures that are needed here and there. How do you stay motivated and keep your eyes on the prize? I think uh, as you stated, passion is, uh, is very important. You need to, be, to feel that uh, what you are doing is what uh, that, uh, keeps, keeps, keeps you, what you are doing is something that uh, you, you, you don't get tired of uh, doing what you are doing every day. And another thing is uh, consistency, that even uh, during the, when you, the roadblocks come and, uh, and they, they thought they, they should not uh, be a way to like, uh, make your morale go down, you should, uh, you sh you should uh, follow, you sh like uh, if you get a, a, certain, a certain, maybe the tax that needs to be, to be done, need to find the right procedure to follow it and a uh, good thing is to find a mentor who will uh, take you in case uh, the roadblocks maybe are not within your maybe your specialization or uh, they're not within your means and you will have uh, a way to go about them okay thanks i think it's important what you've mentioned about a mentor just to walk with you and show you that, I mean, there's, just as Sarah said, there are business cycles, there are ups, there are downs, there are peaks, there are off peaks. And now, Sarah, you talked about record keeping, and if there are so many uh, uh, facets of a business. How important is it to have professionals who are good at a specific area? Because it's a balance between cutting your costs or keeping your costs down as a startup and having professionals because, you know, we have taxes. You don't want to not know how to file your taxes and then you end up being slapped with a fine. But is it important to have these, an accountant, a HR person, a salesperson, and at the same time, cut your costs. So how do you balance that as somebody who's just starting up, keeping your costs low, but as well getting the professionals who can show you how to do your record keeping, make sure you do your HR properly, you're following the law, have a legal person in case you get into trouble. How do you keep that balance? Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, for you to balance and as an entrepreneur, to balance about your bookkeeping and also the legal aspect, uh, bookkeeping is very critical in your business. 
Remember here you're starting up your business and uh, mostly most of the startups really struggle with the financial bit about, about their business. So if you don't utilize your finances very well in your business, your likelihood to face a lot of challenges and uh, when uh, a business faces challenges of uh, the finances, it, is, it has so many challenges that might drive the business to maybe close down or maybe reinventing, reinventing the business again. So that you don't go through that term oil, uh, it is good to keep your records very well. And if you don't have the knowledge of how you should keep your books very well or record keeping, you can uh, approach Equity Bank. We normally have entrepreneurship education trainers. They'll take you through how to keep your records very well. Uh, every year you need uh, to be taken through auditing of your book. You need to take it to a professional who can audit your report. He, can help be, he or she can be able to tell you these expense, expenses, you need to cut down on them. This may be, you may be misusing the money. Sometimes when you're starting up, you don't have that knowledge, but it is good you have somebody who is directing you in bookkeeping and also have auditors who will be auditing uh, your, your business. Maybe you can uh, seek from a consultancy whereby they have specialized people who can be able, you will just be paying a small fee to do the consultancy and uh, they check your, your, your records and also see the progress of your business. And also, you also need a legal aspect whereby a person who is there to defend your business because you know if uh, you're on the bad side of the law, of course, maybe your business will face a lot of challenges and maybe it might be affected. So it is good to have those professionals and to be able to be supported in your business to progress well. Okay, thanks for that. Now, Edie, you'll allow me to put you on the spot. <laughs> do you have an auditor who you consult to do your books? Do you have a, an accountant? Do you have a, a legal person in case you have any problems? And uh, what is the effect on your, or your business? Do you feel like it's an expense that I really have to do uh, to prevent long-term problems? Or do you just do everything by yourself? <laughs> no, I don't do everything by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have a team. Okay. I have employed uh, like let's say five guys. So when it comes to legal, yeah, our company is registered and we have a lawyer. You see, for me, it's not. I I don't take it like uh, I'm spending too much money, but this helps me on the other side. Like for now, we were given a job by the county government, and you see, you cannot acquire a job by the county government if your papers are not good, if you are not registered, if you are not. So to me, I think uh, everything is going good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And it's Ant not like I'm losing money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Anthony, how about you? Do you have a, an auditor you come to consult every year? Do you have a legal person? Yeah. Yeah. We what we do. We are a team of two, but we have been uh, in incubation programs, and as a way, as a startup, uh, they need to conceive. One of the services we get from our, incub our incubators is uh, they provide uh, the SOC services, the bookkeeping, the legal aspects, uh, the, task, the tax aspects, and uh, all those aspects. What the, we have are professionals and our incubation programs who do it on our behalf, and uh, they are able to match us with uh, with people from uh, from uh, firms. Maybe it's like accounting; they're able to match up. To match us with people who, as, uh, as the incubators exit, they can now they can now leave the burden to us with uh, people who are knowledgeable in the areas. Okay, okay, thanks for that. Now, uh, Sarah, I want us to discuss a little bit about how to transition from employment to full time uh, your passion. So, for example, I'll give that same example of let's say you love cooking, and you maybe cook for people in your estate every now and then, and it's picked up. People are, are buying your samosas or your mandazis and everything, and you're thinking, oh, there's actually a market here. Then you go to Facebook, you start a page, you see clients coming in, but then you are afraid because, you know, when you leave employment, you know, there's that sort of security in a, a regular paycheck every, every month. How do you make the transition from you've been doing your business here in your estate or wherever it is, and then now move into full-time business because you know there's an up and down just the way you said cycles you're not going to be getting that uh, bank transaction every month and you might suffer how do you set yourself up for success 
Okay, thank you. I would say uh, start small. Start small. When I say start small, uh, maybe you're in the social platform, maybe you're in the WhatsApp, maybe you're in the Facebook or Instagram. Get your orders. Organize just yourself. You just do it small, and then you'll be able to check on your margins. You'll be able to understand the cycles of your business. You'll be able to understand even each month uh, you normally make what because each month will be different. January will never be the same as August. It will never be the same as December. So you start small as you continue working so that you don't cut uh, that stream of money before you've organized yourself in your business. So start small. That's what I would ad advise those people who are doing part-time. Start small. And with time, you'll know, should I leave my employment? Should I come full born? to my business? Do I need to employ someone else to assist me in running my business? But you'll have understood all the cycles of your business and you'll be comfortable to go with whichever decision you make. Okay, now I want us to expound a little bit about this starting small. What does starting small mean? What kind of capital am I looking at? Because it's really relative. I mean, starting small to one person might be like, I'll just set aside 10,000 and I'll start my samosa business. Then to somebody else, let's say in Edie's industry, I mean, if we're talking about camera equipment and whatnot, it, it's not cheap sometimes. Maybe you'll need 200,000, for example. So what is small, really? How, and how do you determine what is the right amount to to start with, yeah, it's small enough, but not too small that, you know, you're never going to scale up. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, for you, when I say start small, uh, you'll have to write a business plan, whereby the business plan will give you a direction. It will give you a direction of what amount would you be need needing in your business. What levels of marketing would you need to do? What levels of legal aspect would you need to have in your business before you step into that business? What documents are there required in that business? What regi registrations is it required for that business to be put in place? So once you've uh, written down the business plan, uh, you'll be able to know uh, what amount you'll start with. It depends with uh, the business that you start in. Maybe a person who is making samosas will not require so much money as a person who is doing entertainment and photography. Maybe it will not be the same as a person who is in the archery. Maybe it will never be the same as for a person who wants to open a mini supermarket. It will never be the same for a person who wants to put a packaging company. So depending on your, uh, the business that you have and uh, you put down your business plan, you'll be able to understand what amount uh, the business would require. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I encourage our viewers to continue to send your questions and comments on our Facebook uh, comment section and we'll sample them. I have someone here who is saying that um, they're really passionate about editing. How do you go out uh, about starting? And I think I'll just go back to you, Sarah. Yes. I'm hammering on this, but I think it's really important for people to understand so that when they start, they start well and they don't give up at the end of it. You're talking about a business plan. Yes. Just Take us through a, a brief description of what a business plan could entail. What okay. sections am I looking at? What are the, the, the sections that I really need to focus on and really research? You talk about the importance of research. What are the elements of a business plan that I should look out for when I'm starting this business? Okay. Uh, I will outline what is required in the business plan. Uh, while, while you're writing your business plan, you'll come up with the business summary, whereby you'll summarize uh, your business in one page. And then you will do a market research. And also you, in the market research, you will identify uh, your niche target of your market, of your customers. Because you need to understand who am I targeting my, my, my business? Yes, I'm setting my business. Who am I targeting to? Is it the youth? Is it the elderly? Is it the mid middle age? Is it the high end? Is it whoever you're targeting? You have to describe it there. Uh, on the marketing research. Then you will go to uh, the aspects that are required in your business. Uh, you'll talk about if it is the machinery that is required in your business. If you don't require machineries, what items are so particular that are supposed to be in your business? Then you'll go to the amount. What amount would you want to utilize in your business? And in this amount, you'll go further and break it down. It will break it down to everything, everything that you'll be buying for that business. Uh, maybe if it is money for the operation of the business, all that will 
put it down and understand, yes, I'm putting uh, aside 200,000 or 100,000 for the business. I've tabled down, I've done like a budget for my business. And after you've done that, uh, you'll go and finish up and, and uh, allocate everything that you're putting up in your business. You allocate, if it is employees, I'll be paying my employees what amount. If, um, if it is uh, the operation, what amount will be required in your business. And uh, everything that will be happening in the business, you have to put it in the business plan so that it can help you to come up with the amount that you would require in your business. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've answered that question yes. or I've left behind something. <laughs> no, no. You've answered it adequately, thanks. Yes. Now I want us to talk a little bit about discipline in business. I, I mean discipline is very important in any facet of life. Now Edie, tell us a little bit about the importance of segregating your company expenses uh, versus your personal expenses because sometimes we hear that businesses fail not because the business concept was flawed but because people just don't know how to segregate their business uh, adequately. So for example, you have an M-Pesa account and the money keeps on coming in and then at the end of the month maybe you feel, ah, let me just take this bit of money, I'll bring it back, but you never bring it back to your business. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then you just keep on taking, 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 and before you know it, your account has nothing and you've just been using it on your own personal expenses. So how do you make sure that you maintain discipline and segregate your business affairs from your personal affairs? Okay, thank you. Okay, to me, like for now at Cute Entertainment, we have a couple of things we do. Apart from entertainment, we also have a t-shirt printing job whereby we do merchandise. So what I do, I have different accounts on the bank. Eh? So I have allocated this, this account is for this job and this account is for this job. And I have my own personal account whereby there now you can get the money I used to spend. So it's very hard for me to tamper with the job's money. Okay. So I've separated my accounts mm. very well. You don't do a transfer. No, I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> and Anthony, how about you? How do you maintain discipline and make sure that your personal finances are different from the business? I think what you have said is important. Uh, for us, what we do is uh, registering a company and having a, a separate bank account for the company is very important. Secondary is where the team comes in. You have a team for your company so that uh, when you are making decisions, you are making them. As a, as a team, and thus uh, there are no temptations to, to to make you. There are no temptations to make uh, like individual de decisions in a company. So when you maintain a decisions as a team, you are able to overcome any temptations to to, to not divide uh, company company money with the uh, personal finances. Okay. 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 Now I'll go back to you, Edie. Uh, are there some weekly or daily rituals that you go through to make sure that you stay successful? They say that, I mean, if you've not planned it or you've not put a set of goals, then things just never happen. So do you have a, a ritual that you go through, let's say, daily or weekly, like these are my targets, um, uh, tick them off as they get done. If they are not done, how are you going to uh, make sure they get done the next week? What is your process like on a weekly basis or even daily? Well, for us, we usually have a weekly target, huh? We usually have a weekly target because uh, for us, we work for different big companies as a marketer and a photography services. So for us, we have a target. And when we don't acquire that, we don't reach the target, we usually sit down as a company and try to see what's happened, what happened to this company, why were we not given the job this week. So. We shall have a target, a weekly target. Okay, okay. And Anthony, how about you? How do you uh, schedule your week? Do you sit down as a team and decide, okay, this is the number of uh, things we need to sell, or how do you go about it? For us, we mainly have, uh, we do our financials on a monthly basis because um, uh, we, we see the cost of production. We mainly divide uh, the cost of production and uh, the unit sold. So we mainly have a, uh, we, we do our financing and uh, planning on a monthly basis. We see how many components, some components we import, some we make uh, locally. So we are able to do on a monthly basis and see the, the cost of production in this month and also the, the, the number of units, the orders we have this month. And uh, in, a monthly, in, a, in a monthly basis, we are able to come up with the, the plan. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Now, Sarah, I want us to talk about um, diversification because sometimes uh, an industry gets a little saturated, so you have to be able to diversify all the time to remain relevant. So how does a business go about deciding, okay, let's add this onto our service uh, provision or to our product provision. So for example, the same thing, I was talking about the person who makes samosas. So maybe when they started off, it was really good. People were really buying these samosas. They were flying off uh, the kitchen and whatnot, and then they added mandazi. But then at a point, it starts to plateau. So how do you determine what to venture into next and make sure that it's still relevant to what you're doing or can you just move into something that's totally different because sometimes you don't want to spread yourself too thin and then you're unable to sustain yourself so how do you go about diversifying in a way that will keep you in business okay thank you for that question uh in diversification we normally say you can diversify uh in the line that you're in or you can diversify on another line uh, when uh, you're diversifying on the same line that we say it is a vas vertical diversification and we have the horizontal diversification we have different types of uh, diversification so you check into your business you check into your business uh, and uh, you also check on the trends that are available in that particular line that you're in if it is samosas maybe you are doing samosas and uh, Probably like, for example, that time uh, COVID really hit uh, our economy and hit uh, most of our business uh, because of the pandemic. Most of the hotel business were really affected. So if you're an entrepreneur, you need to be creative. You need to be innovative. You need to think ahead of you for your business. Because if you fail to be creative and innovative, uh, maybe some trends might uh, wear you out in your business. So it is good to diversify. Uh, when you start with a particular line, maybe you can inquire from your customers. Maybe do a sample with your customers and, uh, and ask them what would they want you to add in, in your business. You'll get an idea of, of what uh, you need to add in your business, on what area do you need to diversify into, or maybe with the trends that are available in the market, you can be able to, to see where you are uh, supposed to diversify as a business. Maybe you need to go outside the business that you're doing because there is another business that is really doing well, but you need to do your market analysis very well. Okay, okay, yes. thanks. Now you've talked about testing and seeing what works. Um, like ED, have you done that before? Like you do the photography or in entertainment and whatnot. You say you do birthdays, you do this and that. Have you reached a point that you said maybe this kind of photography doesn't really work for me and you've just had to abandon it altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. sure, yeah. Mm, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, to start with, uh, you see, when you mentioned the one photography, mm. most of the clients uh, would prefer maybe a studio photo. You see the studio photography. Mm -hmm. So I started that, but to me, I saw things are not adding up. So mm -hmm. I majored into outdoor photography. Mm -hmm. So in outdoor photography, that's where now I saw things are going very well mm. rather than the studio photography. Okay, so had you set up a studio? or yeah, you, were, yeah, yeah. you had your own studio. Yeah, so yeah. you had to close that down or you transformed it into something else? I closed it down and okay. I opened an office instead. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. So that it's important to, to know what works and what doesn't work yeah. so that you can move swiftly yeah. onto something else. Okay, that's good. Now, Anthony, have you experienced something of the sort as well? Seeing something that didn't work, you tested and it didn't quite work and you had to move on quickly onto something else? Yeah. Yeah, we, we have we have been, uh, since our inception, we have been mostly on the pilot phase. And the pilot phase has been uh, working with our, our pilot clients and uh, getting feedback from them. So there are certain aspects, for example, the size, the initial hatchery was uh, 96 capacity. And uh, from uh, feedback from our market, we have been able to, to know that they need uh, larger capacities and we have adjusted and uh, as we speak, we the product we have, uh, as we speak, is uh, from this uh, feedback from the market. Okay, okay, okay. Now, Sarah, I want us to talk a little bit about the human element because it's said that the human element really can make or break a business. Uh, now, how do we make sure we go about recruiting the right people and make sure that we're not flooding our businesses with uh, all kinds of people? Because we talked about having an accountant and whatnot, but these are consultants. So how do we know the people who we will hire 
or do we need to hire people and how do we go about getting the right people and not flooding our business to the point that it's just eating into our uh, resources? How do we go about that? Okay, thank you. Uh, how to go about uh, uh, recruiting uh, a staff in your business? First of all, you have to identify what job will this staff be doing in your business? Uh, what qualification are you looking out? Because this person is coming to support your, your, your business. And if he's not qualified enough, uh, it can break the business or you can end up losing a lot in your business. Mm -hmm. So it is good you go through the cycle of the right recruitment. So you'll identify uh, the job that uh, the staff will be carrying out and then uh, you'll advertise for that position and then you'll carry out an interview uh, for, uh, for the business, uh, for, for your business and for the staff uh, that you want to recruit. Then from there, you'll select the best. You'll select the best from the panel, you'll select the best. And then with the best, you'll bring in the staff and induct that staff in all the business processes that happen in your business. That new staff need to know from the entry point of your business to the the exit point of your business. In case maybe you're not available or you engage, that staff is able to handle everything across the business. Then from there, uh, there are ways that you can motivate uh, your staff. Uh, and maybe I'll not, I'll just mention a few. Uh, giving, uh, giving your staff uh, a good pay, that is the right pay. Uh, giving your staff maybe bonuses uh, at the time, maybe they work overtime. Uh, Promoting your staff when uh, your business requires a senior management personnel, you can you can you can promote uh, your staff. They'll feel motivated, and so many many other ways uh, to motivate your staff. And with that, you'll have a concrete employee in your system. Okay. And now keeping in that, you know, sometimes we come together with friends, we are passionate about something, whether it's that photography or like the hatchery business that we're in, and we're passionate about it and we start a business. How do we put uh, good structures to make sure that we separate friendship from business? Because sometimes uh, businesses fail because there was, it was really blurry or you are just like friends and you thought, I mean, let's just start this. And then, you know, business can be <laughs> tough and then things have to be divided. So how do you put that balance between putting structures, your good friends or your colleagues or whatever, how do you put structures to make sure that in case of anything, it's very clear what goes to who or how the business will continue? Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, while you, you're employing, whether you're employing a family member, whether you're employing uh, a relative, whether you're employing a close friend or a, a friend of a friend, you need to take them through the cycles of uh, recruiting. They need to go through the selection. They need to go through the interviews. They also need to be inducted. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also need to know the cut lines of the business. They also need to know uh, the duties that uh, they are required to carry out. And also, you need to be strict with them. You don't bring friendship in your business. If you bring their friendship in your business, the business might likely not work as you would want to for it to work okay yes okay, thanks now as we wind up i'd like uh anthony and uh, edie to tell us a little bit about um the link between passion and purpose do you find that you're passionate about photography and entertainment and everything do you feel like it's linked to your purpose or it's your purpose is something different or do you even uh think there is anything with like passion and purpose to me, my passion is linked to my purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, this is something I wanted to do even before I started to do it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So to me, they must be connected. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me, what has been your greatest achievement that has given you so much satisfaction from what you started? And you said, this was really worth starting. Okay, my biggest achievement uh, to mention is uh, working with big companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like working with a big telecommunication company in Kenya, working with the county government, working with big companies. So, so that really motivates me and keeps me going. Mm -hmm. Like for now, uh, at Kinto Entertainment, you see, we started as a photography. Now we are do, we have the DJ machines, we have the merchandise printing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now we, the, the job is growing. We have a lot of things we do. 
Okay, that's good. How about you, Anthony? Um, do you feel there's a link between uh, your passion and purpose and what has been your greatest achievement in your hatchery business that makes you feel like I made the right decision starting this business? So me, I think there is a great uh, link between passion and purpose. Specifically through the fact that uh, through our passion, we are able to create uh, our vision as a company through by pursuing my passion, I'm able to create uh, employment opportunities in uh, our target market in the marginalized areas. So the fact that we, when we take a hatchery to a farmer in a marginalized area, we are able to create employment. It's a great fulfillment of my passion. And uh, for example, when you go and uh, you install your client and our client tells you that it's their, it, it's their, it's, it's their plan. For example, our client tells you this is uh, my retirement plan. You see there, there is a great uh, link between your purpose, your passion, your purpose and uh, fulfillment. Okay, thanks for that. Now, as we wrap up, Sarah, what would you tell uh, an aspiring entrepreneur there, somebody who's passionate about something but is a little scared about taking that plunge to starting that business? What would you tell them about just going for it but doing it in a wise way? Okay, what I would say uh, for those uh, viewers who have a very nice passion and uh, they have seen a business potential in it, uh, just like I said, you will start small. Uh, you will do your market research very well. Uh, don't feel discouraged. Don't feel discouraged. There will, become, there, there will come challenging times. Just be resilient. Be committed into, uh, into business. That passion will motivate you. It is like a driving force. Uh, I normally say passion normally drives your purpose. Because with your passion, you will feel like you're appreciating whatever you're doing on your daily basis. You'll appreciate the business that you've come in. And because you have uh, uh, that passion, just start wherever you are. Don't be a perfectionist. Just start where you are. Learn from your mistakes. And uh, through your mistakes, you will, you'll be able to grow further your business and maybe reinvent and become very creative in that particular business that you have. Okay, thank you for that. I just want to sample a few of the comments on Facebook. Um, there, Kiranga, Anthony, you have some of your classmates here <laughs> who are shouting out and they're saying, uh, good job, keep being persistent. Uh, you're a good example of a persistent and passionate entrepreneur. Um, there's somebody else here who's saying, Idi, good job. And they're all saying congratulations. So yes, uh, you're all doing a good job. And as Sarah has said that you, and all of you have said really, you need to start small, you need to do your research, and you really need to be resilient. Just as in anything in life, you need to be resilient because businesses have cycles. And really it's possible to make profit from your passion, but you really have to be strategic about it and do your research. Uh, so thank you so much to all our panelists, to Idi Mugo, to Sarah uh, Nyingi, and to Anthony Kiranga for participating in this conversation on tapping our passion to turn it into a profitable business. Uh, this has been the Disruption Show. I have been your host, Claire Munde, sitting in for Waihi Gamwaura, who will be in next week. Until next week, you have a good evening. Thank you.